Hi, Morgan here for One Infinity, and today I'm going to show you just how easy it is to carve a 3D topography relief like this one on your One Infinity CNC. And I'm kind of dumb, so when I say it's easy, buddy, you're going to fly through it. So this is a 3D topography relief map I carved last week of the island of St. Lucia. That's where my wife and I ran away and got married, and we're coming up our 12 year anniversary. So this seemed like a good way to commemorate the milestone. So if there are any geographically unique locations that are special to you, it's oddly specific. Uh, this is a real fun project, super easy to do, and it makes a great gift. I hope. I've wanted to do one of these for a while, but to be perfectly honest, I just couldn't figure it out. So I put it off. Every resource that I looked at was from very capable makers, all with their own unique methods. Turns out there's a ton of different ways you can do this, and most of them involve complex multi-step processes and somewhat tricky file conversions just to get a file that you can drop into your toolpathing software. Once it's in there, it's a breeze. It's actually creating the model that I found so difficult, and I tried. I really did, but remember, kind of dumb. But then I found a website called Touch Terrain, and it was the answer to my prayers. It's a web-based tool that allows you to search by location, select an area, and there's just a few settings you need to play around with to get it looking the way you want. Couldn't be easier. So without further ado, let's dive right in. We'll start by visiting the Touch Terrain website. We put a link in the description for you. The home page shows a map of the whole world. Just click in the general area you want to create a model for. Then you can zoom in and out, scroll around just like you normally would on like Google Maps. I know I want to do St. Lucia, so I just type it into the search bar here. And whoop, there it is. Then you'll need to hit the button that says recenter box on map so it knows that this is the area you'll be working with. Now we can start playing around with the settings. There's a list of a bunch of different elevation data sources that you can choose from. I've had good luck with the one labeled AW3D30. I have no idea what all those letters and numbers mean, just works. The next setting you're going to look at is scale. You'll need to scale the model according to the size of the material you want to carve. I recommend setting it a bit oversized because you can always scale it down in your toolpathing software without losing any detail. I'll be carving the model in this piece of oak that came down in my yard during a hurricane. It's plenty thick for the model and it's just the right shape. I want the island itself to be about 8 inches, which is just north of 200 millimeters. So I'm going to select 140 millimeters from the drop down list, giving me a height of 226.2 millimeters. I set the model base thickness to zero, so I have some flexibility as far as where I position the model within the z-axis later on. The only other setting you may want to change is the vertical exaggeration. I'm not going to mess with that because this is a very mountainous island and there's already a good amount of vertical contrast. But if you're creating a model for a location that doesn't have much elevation, you may want to bump that up to give the model some depth. Anyway, now we can preview the model and enjoy this weird little animation while we wait. Okay, scroll around, rotate it, zoom it in and out, make sure it looks right, and if you're happy with it, download the model. It'll spit out an STL, which you can import directly to your toolpathing software. Open a new project, put in the size of your material, and import your STL. Here you'll be able to scale and position it along the z-axis. First I'm going to center the model relative to the material to make sure it's the right size, and scale it if need be. I can have the top of the highest mountain flush with the top of the material, or have the ocean level with the bottom, or anywhere in between. I'm going to set mine to the top of the material. Now I want to carve out around the island, but not all the way to the edge of the material. And this would be a lot less complicated if my material was a regular shape, but because I like to make things unnecessarily difficult for myself, I went with this cookie. I want the pocket around the island to somewhat follow the shape of the whole piece, so what I did was trace around the cookie with a marker, took a photo, and just vectorized the basic shape. When I imported the vector, I scaled it to make sure it fit, then offset the edge toward the inside to give me the outline of the pocket. It's not perfect, but it's better than just a circle or a rectangle. Then under the Modeling tab, select the model and click this button here that says Create Vector Boundary Around Selected Model. I'll cut the pocket around the island a little deeper because I'm going to be pouring in some epoxy. And truth be told, I don't use a whole lot of epoxy, so I'm not very good at it. Actually, I'm terrible at it. The first one of these I did to test the process, I didn't make the pocket around the model deeper. So when I poured the epoxy, it was just a little too much, and I lost a good portion of the shoreline, sinking entire coastal towns as if all the polar ice caps melted in an instant. Those poor people. Anyway, doing this is going to give me a little bit more control. Alright, let's get this sucker toolpathed, starting with the pocket around the island. 
Select both the vector around the model and the one created to follow the shape of the cookie, then create a pocket toolpath. I know that the bottom of the 3D model is about a half inch below the top of the material, so I'll make this pocket three quarters of an inch deep. I'm using a quarter inch down cut spiral end mill, cutting 100 inches per minute in three passes. Next is the 3D roughing toolpath. For this we'll be using a quarter inch upcut ball nose bit. I set the machining boundary to the model and selected 3D raster as the roughing strategy. Also make sure to check the box that says avoid machined areas, that'll just save you some time. And this next part is very important, make sure that your plunge rate and your feed rate are the exact same on 3D cards like this. The feed rate will only move as fast as the plunge rate, so if you want a feed rate of 100 inches per minute, just make sure that your plunge rate is also set to 100 inches per minute. Alright, let's go ahead and preview that. Looks good. Moving on. And before starting this project, I reached out to our friends at Bits and Bits and asked them for some guidance as far as what would be the best bits and the best settings to use for a carver like this. Here's what they said. Typically, we recommend a roughing pass with a quarter inch ball nose just to get a bulk of the material out. Then a finishing pass with either a 1 8 or a 1 16 inch. All our tapered bits are an upcut, as a downcut in a carve would most likely damage the detail of the carve when pushing chips or fibers back down. It's much cleaner to shear and pull chips out. For the angle of the taper, the smaller the degree, the longer the cut length, and the deeper the tool can reach into the carve. We recommend 12 degrees for a good starter bit, especially if carves are shallower. Also a much quieter carve than a sharper angle. We recommend the spindle at 16 to 18,000 RPMs, 80 to 120 inches per minute, and depth of cut equal to the tip diameter. Step over is usually about 8 to 10 percent on a finish pass. Obviously a 16th inch tip would take much longer than an eighth inch, but it's capable of much more detail than an eighth inch. The choice of bits at that point would depend on your design. Also we think you're super handsome and charming. Your mom must be so proud. Well shucks guys. So leaning on their expertise, I did the roughing toolpath as instructed then moved on to the 3D finishing toolpath. For that one, I used a 12 degree, three flute, eighth inch ball nose bit with the plunge rate and feed rate set to 80 inches per minute. Once that one's done, you've got all your toolpaths. Just save the G code and load up the machine. I secured the piece to my wasteboard and zeroed out my X and Y axes on what I thought was close to the center. It was a little hard to tell because of the odd shape, so I ran a very shallow profile toolpath with a V bit. Turns out I was way off, so I reset my X and Y axes, probe for Z. It's all cut out. You'll notice that around the edges of the model, there's all kinds of fuzz. That's because we use an upcut bit to preserve the appearance of the model. No big deal. Just spend a few minutes cleaning up those edges, preferably as inefficiently as possible, like I did. Just really savor it, you know? Now all that's left to do is pour some epoxy, and then we're all done. I give it a pretty generous amount of sanding sealer to hopefully reduce some of the bubbles, and bada bing, bada boom, it worked. Like I said, I put off doing one of these maps for a long time because I was just intimidated by the process of actually creating the model. So if you've been hesitant about doing one for the same reason, I hope you found this helpful. And if you did find it helpful and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so that you get notifications whenever we post new videos. All right, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Y'all be good.